Good morning, everyone. Hi, friends. Uh, it's crazy, as Mark said yesterday, like you're too busy, like still having conversations. How are you? How is Friday night? Fun? Awesome, awesome. So I'm not Mark Pittman, <laughs> uh, but I, I get to do some fun things today. So I'm going to channel my inner Mark Pittman, and I'm going to share housekeeping with you. Uh, I have notes, all right? So the first is, how many of you have noticed in the conference sessions that we have blankets? So that is something that we always do, um, just because conference rooms get cold, right? If you are upstairs, this room, that room, if any of you want to take those home, take them home, okay? That's, please, 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 or else we have to haul them back in the bus. So please take them home, okay? The second thing that I wanted to talk about is every year, we, as alumni, we all sign a conference poster. And we have these, actually Chris has these in his office where every year we have these posters of all the alumni that sign them. So our fourth year poster is just right outside the door. So please grab a Sharpie and sign that. It's very special to us. One thing, also questions about what's going on with the airport, right, and the parade. So the parade is actually running from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So we'll probably catch the tail end of that traffic, but basically it takes 10 minutes to get to the airport. And so what the hotel is saying is just plan on 35 minutes to the airport. So it shouldn't affect you all that much, uh, but just know you're gonna wanna leave a little bit earlier. Got it, 35 minutes? Great, and Leah, will you come up here? Cause you just, ha you have an announcement. Come on, come. she's back everybody, she's back. <laughs> I have a Commonwealth country announcement. <laughs> um, so in the Commonwealth today is Remembrance Day, not Veterans Day, and uh, folks, my fellow Canadians, Australians, and others who might be very confused about why we're having parades and fireworks today, um, because it's actually a very somber occasion for the Commonwealth, um, I would be very happy if anyone wants to join me at 11 a.m., which is when we observe a moment of silence out on the sun deck there. Um, it won't be all that quiet, but at least we can do our little thing together. And, and you don't need to be part of the Commonwealth if you want to be part of that as well. Okay, 11 a.m. on the sun deck, got it. Okay, so day one, story sculpting. Day two, story implementation. You guys, you guys feel like you're getting that? Right, and today, uh, I don't have a story something. I have, this is all about getting new donors and the most important thing, getting that second gift. So you're gonna, in your sessions today, step by step, Mark's gonna talk about it a little bit later, but we are very excited um, for this day. And this is the first time we've ever had a third day. And I'll be honest, it's the coolest thing ever. Although I'm really tired, it is so cool to have you all here for day three. I get to introduce Mark Pittman to you. So Mark Pittman, it's kind of like when you have a baby and all of a sudden like you're a mom or a dad and that becomes your moniker, right? And you're like, no, I'm, I'm a person with dreams and hopes and aspirations. Okay, Derek's mom. I think that <laughs> happens with Mark because he is our MC. And a lot of times we start to just, oh, Mark, he's amazing. He's our ambassador of ceremonies. He keeps us going. Oh, but Mark, you are so much more right? Um, how many of you have actually read Mark's book, Ask Without Fear? Oh, yes. Okay. An amazing book. Uh, this book is actually translated into four different languages, right? Four at this point. Um, two of them, which is really cool. One is Dutch, and my husband is from Amster I mean, from the Netherlands, and we, he speaks Dutch. One is Chinese. I speak Chinese, as well as Polish and Spanish. Who speaks Polish? Okay, no, no, I was wondering, and oh, she died, you, we got one, no. Oh, nice, got it, sister. And then who speaks Spanish? Yeah, look at that. So um, it's pretty phenomenal that it's been translated so many times that it continues to be an amazing bestseller. The other thing to know about Mark is he has a master's in organizational leadership, as well as he's a Franklin Covey certified coach, which is really great. When I describe Mark, to people. I like to think of Ichiro Suzuki 
Do any of you know who he is? Yeah, awesome, awesome. So Ichiro Suzuki is a Major League Baseball player. He's in his 40s. He's the oldest position player right now in Major League Baseball. But what he is known for is his work ethic. He is the first to get to the park. He's the last to leave the park. And he wants to play forever and ever. And when I think of Ichiro Suzuki and who is that in our sector, I know it is Mark Pittman for sure. Um, his work ethic is unparalleled. And you'll find with this conference or at any conference, he is, will always, he will stay till the end to make sure that you have your questions answered, which is a powerful thing. The other thing that I would like to say about Mark is, when people ask me what, you know, about Mark Pittman, I say, Mark Pittman is service-driven and purpose-powered. I really believe that. Yes, absolutely. And you are going to be learning from him today, and you're going to see exactly what it is, and you're going to be very inspired. We are the, we're going to do something. This is the third day. So Mark has been amazing. And sometimes he doesn't even get to get, go to the restroom because he's too busy doing everything else. Can all of us just please stand up and clap and just give him a super warm welcome? Yay, thank you. <laughs> I am super excited to be here, as I always am. But today, this is a first. I've never done a keynote at a nonprofit storytelling conference. This is what I do every you know, 360 days of the year, but not here. So I'm really excited to do this. You guys, again, I need to tell you, are amazing. Um, you are, you're here. It's the third day. We've never had a third day at this conference, but you've asked for that, and we're delivering that. And we are excited about the implementation stuff you're going to have and the, the techniques that you're going to have today. Um, what I would love to, what I've been charged to do is talk about the leadership aspect of getting new donors. Because fundraising is a leadership issue. I've always been a leadership coach, and I happen to do fundraising well, so I became fundraising coach. But you know that good fundraising and good marketing gets trumped by bad leadership any day. And, and no matter how good you are at the stuff you've learned in this conference, it could get messed up if you don't have good leadership. So we're going to go through how do we get board members to actually invite people to us, we're also going to look at um, how do we tell our story in a way that's engaging to them. And then we're going to look at us as leaders. Because what it comes down to is none of us are victims. We all have to make a choice about what kind of leaders we're going to be and what kind of impact we want to have on the world. So I have to warn you, my wife reminds me that the more introverted people like to be warned. So in about 20 minutes, I'm going to have everybody stand up and we're going to move in different parts. Don't worry, you won't have to talk. I'll do all the talking and the extroverts will try to compete with me, but um, we're going to have some fun about how do we get these new donors in, how do we engage our board members, uh, and you know, so fasten your seatbelts, we're going to go for a good ride. Yesterday was riding a wave, we're going to ride another wave today. Would, wouldn't it be great if you said to your board members, could you just open up your Rolodex and they actually did it? I mean, they don't, right? So when I asked about, I asked about uh, remember LinkedIn used to have a question and answers category on their, uh, on their module? No, all right, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I've been on, like, I started blogging in 1999. Back in, like, the dark ages, uh, LinkedIn had this question and answers thing, and I get tired of, the, where do we find new donors? How do we find new donors? And I get tired of telling people, you use your board. You start with the first circle, and you move to the second, and then you move to the third. So I asked hundreds of experts on LinkedIn, where do we get new donors? And it's, I blogged about some of the best ones, the best answers, because it came down to, you talk to your board. You recruit board members that recruit supporters and advocates and, and people that are passionate about your cause. So why aren't they doing that? Why aren't they rolling out their Rolodex and doing this? Do any of you in this room, and I know some of you do, have people that their board members are actively recruiting new supporters for your cause? Yeah, okay, sweet. Okay, everybody else, how many don't? How many board members aren't doing that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, talk to the people that raised their hands before, but we're going to teach you some secrets on how to make it so it's easier for your board members to do that. One CEO I worked at at a hospital said, we want to make it ridiculously easy for physicians to work here. And so ever since then, I've wanted to make it ridiculously easy for people to support our cause. So one of the ways we can do that is by letting them know where we're going. 
So far, we've learned about the episodic set of stories. We've learned about the donor story. We've learned about the impact story. We've learned about your nonprofit story in, in slivers and chunks. And that's good. You'll want to take those back with you. But you're, if your board isn't telling other people excitedly about your cause, it's likely because they don't know where you're going. You're not going to invite a friend on a journey when you don't know if it's going to be a train wreck. You're not really sure where this is all headed. Yeah, the Susie got, got fed, or, or the history of our, our, our neighborhood is preserved, or the arts are prevalent in our community, but I'm not sure where it's going. So let's talk about that. Computer, we did some research with the Concord Leadership Group, um, and we asked the people, leaders, what is it, how important is having a compelling vision? 83% said it's one of their top three categories. They, they know as a leader they need to communicate a compelling vision. But a whopping 62% said they didn't even know where to begin in creating one. Now, we found the secret in this research, too. Watch this. When we ask people, do you have a common shared vision that your stakeholders can all communicate at all different points? People without a written strategic plan, less than half said, yeah, we have that. Only 47% said, yeah, we have that kind of vision. People with a written strategic plan, 77% of the organizations that have a written strategic plan said, we can definitely have a shared, board members know what we're about, volunteers know what we're about, staff knows what we're about. And it, and it stands to reason, doesn't it? Because a written strategic plan forces you to have the conversations about what's important. But have you ever tried to write a written strategic plan? If you Google it, 1.4 million hits in less than one second. And that's nonprofit strategic planning. That's not just organizational strategic planning. And as Bill Littlejohn said the other day, it kind of gathers dust on the shelf. You know, it just, you do it, you get excited because your board is activated primarily at two times in the, in the normal nonprofit. When they're doing a strategic planning process and when they're firing the CEO. <laughs> now, if you're the CEO, it might be really good to get them to do a strategic plan to get the sights off of your admitted back and onto the strategic plan. They love the visioning, they love the dreaming, and then we kind of let it sit. It either gathers dust on the shelf or it gathers digital dust in our shared drive. So what we've done is tried to simplify it um, and with our research and all into four categories. Two of them are gonna shock you. One of them shouldn't shock you and one of them will. The first, what we do is we call it a story-based strategic plan. And it's just four questions. And we'll unpack these before we go into the leadership journey. The first question is, what are we doing and why are we doing it? So I know that's really two questions. I get it. So think of it as like 1A and 1B maybe. I don't know. But what, what are we doing? You know where you can find this? In your founding story. Your nonprofit was started to create, a, create to right a wrong. Somebody saw something that needed fixing. There, there isn't ballet in our community and we need that. Or, kids aren't getting tutored, or they're, you know, this land is getting consumed by bad environmental stuff, we need to clean it up. Something happened was wrong, that was wrong. And even if your founder isn't someone you really want to associate yourself with anymore, I won't ask for a raise of hands on that, but if you have a founder that kind of, founder syndrome is a name because it's real, um, if that happened, what are the values that your founder had? What were the, the values that they, they put in there? So in a traditional strategic plan, it would be mission and vision would be in here. But we don't like to get all academic about, well, that's not really a vision. That's a mission because it has the action future. Da, da. It's why are you doing what you're doing? But definitely articulate your guiding values. This is so important in the 21st century because everything is changing really quickly. And your staff needs to know, when I'm straddling the fence, where, what are the values that I use as my judgment call? Where are the risks that are okay for me to take? And where are the ones that aren't? Early in my career, I was working at a, the boarding school that we heard Charles went to, uh, Stony Brook School. And I got, I don't, this probably never happened to any of you, but I, got a, I had a list of everything that was, uh, I was doing that year. And then I had a list uh, of everything that my boss asked me to do in addition in the new year. Um, and so I put it all on a legal pad. I had all the stuff that I was currently doing and then all the new things that she thought it would be really good for me to add to my, my full-time job already. At a boarding school, living in a dorm, having meals with the kids, triple threat thing. So um, I got, went there, I went to her office and I said, could you help me please? Why? I said, well, and I showed her my page. These are all the things I'm doing now. These are all the things that you'd like me to add to in the new fiscal year. And they're all really important. In individuality, I could see why they're all the most important thing I can do. But I don't live in individuality. 
I live in, I only have 24 hours in my life, and I, and I want to do the best for the school. I need to know when the alumni calls into my office, do I lean on this side and pick up the phone because we have a value that people talk to human beings and not voicemail? Or do I lean to this side and keep working on that grant proposal because the deadline's coming up and we need the funding? I just, I just need some guiding values to figure this out. She leaned back in her chair. <laughs> And I thought I had screwed up. <laughs> I thought she was ticked. And she said, I said, what? And, and I knew I was taking a risk. She said, I wish I could do this to the headmaster. Because he keeps giving me more stuff to do, too. <laughs> so what are your values? What are you doing? Why are you doing this and why? The second question is, well, how are we going to get it done? So we want this glorious future. We want this amazing thing. What are the, the steps that we're going to take to get there? What are our goals? What are our objectives? And how are we going to do this? Well, in our research, we found out that nonprofits don't do things called environmental assessments. The vast majority of nonprofits that have a written strategic plan never checked to see if anybody else was doing something similar. They just had a good idea, and they knew it needed to get done, and that's great. That can-do spirit is great. But we're missing opportunities because there are other people doing similar things around us, and it can either help us to find the niche about, hey, how we're different, like the Fight CRC people, get behind a cure, this is crap. They have a real fun, playful thing with a pain in the butt disease. See what I, see what I did there? Colorectal cancer, pain in the butt. Okay, but they knew that they could be playful about something that was really life-threatening, just like Charles said about NCIS. We can have jokes because it's life. We, don't, we do not insult the issue, but we have levity around it. And that was a need within their, in their sector because they did an environmental analysis. Now, I'm working with Rogare. Uh, it's a fundraising think tank out of, the, out of the UK, Center for Sustainable Philanthropy. Adrian Sargent and uh, Ian McQuillan are over that, and Jen Chang's influencing it too. Uh, they have something in other organizational leadership called a PESL. So this is something you could write down, and then you could Google it and find the Danny Kay clip of uh, being in King Arthur's court about the vessel with the pestle is the uh, potion with the poison. Uh, some of you Danny Kay fans will get that. Um, but this is a pestle is like, you look at, it's an environmental scan. What's the political environment we're in? What's the economic environment? What's the social environment? What's the technological environment? And there's a couple others. I don't know what the other L and E are. But that's really cool, because you're looking out there. What's going on in the world? And how do we fit in that? And then you do a SWOT analysis. What are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? What are we good at? What are we bad at? Where can we excel? And what are the things that might take us down? Uh, and then that's part of how you, you do this, because you know what we get to do in, in our nonprofits around the world right now, except for hospitals. There's healthcare, it doesn't have this freedom as much. We get to write our own report card. We get to tell donors what impact they're making because there's no standard for a good impact. Yeah, there are some, there's some groups that are trying to create some sort of impact scorecard with Better Business Bureau and the people that help make the overhead myth be real. Um, so there, there are people that have made, dug themselves into a hole and they're trying to get out of it, but right now that's, there's no standards, so we get to report on what's important to us based on question one, what are our values? So what are we going to do and how are we going to get it done? Do your assessment scans, check out your environment. Then this is one that is important, the third question. It should always be in any planning process. How are we going to fund it? But as you can see on the screen, we don't call it that at Concord Leadership Group. We call it how are we going to resource it? Because if you're just measuring money, you're measuring the wrong metric. It's, you, some of us have fees. Some of us have other forms of revenue, maybe sales, maybe events, maybe other things. And there's philanthropy, of course. That's what a lot of us do in this, in this room. But there's other ways that we can resource our organizations. There are strategic partnerships. Um, how many, do, uh, people here know Hilde Gottlieb? Creating the future. All right, she is in Arizona, and she's like, she's an amazing philosopher when it comes to thinking about the work that we do, the impact work that we do differently. Um, she doesn't like calling us nonprofits or charities. We're community benefit organizations, CBOs. Language is important, and she's trying to shape that language. When she, she started the first diaper bank in the, in the United States, there were people that needed diapers. Homeless people or people on the, at risk weren't getting diapers, and there was a need to, to fulfill that. So they started a diaper bank. And as she was talking with her board, they wanted to rent a warehouse space. Cost something in the budget. And so then somebody said, well, what if we had partnered with another nonprofit? Maybe there's another nonprofit with a warehouse that we could work with. And fortunately, she had recruited good enough, well, yeah, good enough board members that one of the other board members said, why does it have to be a nonprofit? What if there's a business in town that has a warehouse space? Life-changing. 
there was a business that had a warehouse space that was mostly empty but needed when it was needed to, they needed the space for when they needed it, but most of the time it wasn't being used. They were thrilled to volunteer that space for resourcing the diapers. And as the, the mission grew, they ended up sh giving them a van so that they could drive the di diapers around to the different places that needed it. A wonderful relationship happened out of it because they didn't just focus on the money, they focused on the mission. And they realized, oh wow, we can resource this in different ways. We can be collaborative, we can work together. So that's the third question. Uh, the reason I said no, most people don't do it is in our research, most people write a strategic plan and then they don't even fund it. They just drop it on the development office and say, oh great, I'm sure this has ever happened to you, but I've had the board member come in and say, super excited that you're gonna raise that extra $100,000. <laughs> what? And you don't wanna look dumb, so you say, oh yeah, uh, what, what excites you most about that project? Because <laughs> you haven't been told what the project is, you're trying to figure that out. Then the fourth one is the one that is probably gonna surprise you in the strategic planning process, but it shouldn't in this conference, you guys are ahead of the curve here, um, is who are we gonna tell about it? Most of us write a strategic plan and the reason it sticks, stays on the, on the shelf is that we don't have any built-in uh, wiring to share it. And we need to, you, you, you guys are already doing some of the sharing. Board members need to hear it, donors need to hear it, we get that. But if you're noticing some of the pressures on nonprofits around the world, we need our local, regional, and national officials to know what we're doing. We need them to hear our institutional story and the impact that it's making in ways that they, they care about. We need to let them know that our impact on the community is helping not have government not have to pay for stuff. We have to be strategic about that. But even more importantly, we have to tell the story internally. And I've been so thrilled that our speakers have been sharing that also here at this conference. When I worked at a hospital running the fundraising, I saw myself as the keeper of the lore. That was like my title. Ah, I was development, head of the foundation, whatever, but I was the keeper of the lore. I kept the stories that I was, I was trusted with the history. People would come to me and tell me the history of the hospital that their experience was, and that was such an honor. And then one day, for whatever reason, I turned and told one of the nurses. It's like, you know, I was just talking at Rotary and this person was so thrilled with the care you gave. Thank you so much for giving them that care because that, that's what makes it so great to work here. Totally life-changing. For the first time in any, and maybe in her career, she realized, somebody cares. The work I do matters. And she became this internal advocate that was driving new donors to me. She'd be like, she'd come to me. It was hard to stop her. I kind of created a cool monster. She came to me, kind of like maybe a Sesame Street monster. She came to me <laughs> and she said, I've got this guy that I, and I was HIPAA, you know, there's all the HIPAA stuff, and I was trying to rewrite HIPAA and all this other stuff. She said, I've had this patient, and you, you gotta hear this experience, and I said, I'm not sure I'm supposed to hear this. She said, no, no, I asked him. I said, that was a great story. Could I tell Mark and our foundation about this, because I'm sure he wants to connect with you. That's all it took to make it so it was within the realm of, pri the privacy thing, uh, requirement was, was satisfied. So she, and then other people started doing this too. If, it was really cool when that happened because in this particular hospital, um, they got more excited about the United Way fund drive than they did about our own hospital's drive. And I, all the United Ways, yeah, United Ways, yay, good for you. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Love you guys. Um, but it was really weird as, as anybody that's trying to raise money for their paychecks, uh, and they're raising money for other parts of the community, which was great, but it was, I didn't, how do I tap into all these program people's experiences? Part of it was just turning to them and sharing the external experiences that I was having with the people I was communicating with. And then it became this virtual sloop of, oh, we're all in this together. Um, and I'm not trying to subcontract fundraising to the program people. I just want to help them do their job better, you know, even more, have more resources to do it. So who are we going to tell about it is the fourth question. Now. That's great. Okay, Mark, strategic planning 101. Yeah, I know I should be doing that, but I'm not. And part of the reason is, it's a question of leadership. So where we need to know individually and as organizations is where are we on this leadership journey? So in the last year, we've created this four quadrants of leadership model that I'm just gonna walk us through and then we're gonna do an exercise in quadrant three um, that's gonna have you all getting up. See the second warning? You're gonna, everybody's gonna be getting up and I'm gonna be standing in the middle of the room. Um, the first, axis on this particular quadrant is external and internal. And the second is confident and unsure. So the external and internal is how, where are you getting your cues for your leadership style? Are you getting it externally or are you checking your, your intuition and your, and your experience? 
And then how confident do you feel or how un or unsure of yourself do you feel? Quadrant one leadership is the observe stage. This is the new leader typically. These are people that get the, that get the title and they're so <laughs> excited. Yes, I'm a leader and I've seen great leaders and I know I just need to copy what they're doing and I'll do it here and this is gonna be awesome. They're, the best part about observant quadrant is you learn who, who are the right people to follow and you also learn how to follow them well. So you learn what activities, you become really, um, really skilled at analyzing people or looking at people's uh, styles, habits, work habits. What do you ask questions like, what do you do before you did that? What do you do after? So it's a really good quadrant to be in. But if you've ever been on that sort of, in that quadrant, you start moving into the second quadrant when you're all excited, full of exuberance, and you turn around and realize, no one's following me. You know, if you're a leader and there's no one following you, you're just out for a walk. So your confidence starts going down and you start wondering, uh, this isn't working the way I thought it was. Or they made it look so easy. It's not that easy. I must be broken and doing something wrong. So you move into quadrant two leadership, which is looking for that, that external, again, just trying to figure out what, what, are, what books are out there, what conferences, what podcasts. I want the formula. I want the seven steps to the creating a compelling vision. I want the time management tips for super, superheroes. I want all the stuff, and you get the formulaic stuff. And this quadrant is great, because you learn to learn. You learn what resonates with you. You learn how to consume information. If you're an audio learner, if you're a written word learner, if you're an, an experienced learner, kinesthetic learner, you learn that stuff, and you just consume as much as you can. And you read getting things done, and you hear like how it's going to change your life, because you can write everything into lists, and all your life is lists, and David Allen becomes a superhero for you. But you move into quadrant three leadership when you start realizing, getting things done doesn't work for me. That doesn't work. At least per, that was part of my journey. I realized, wow, I don't like this list. I am not a list. I am a human being, and I'm not a human being that does lists well. Well, I do them, but then I never look at them again. So this isn't working for me. But what did work for me about getting things done was the action step stage. At doing the list and then having that action step after was brilliant, and that's something I needed to have. That's where you start looking at your internal cues. You start thinking, what works for me and what doesn't? And you start giving yourself permission and start trusting yourself to be able to make judgment calls. All right, that's what Ken Blanchard says, and these are the parts that I can take from that. And that's what Stephen Covey says over here, and these are the parts that fit me. And as you start living out this analyzed stage, you grow in confidence and you move into quadrant four leadership, which is a focused leader. You're the one that knows you have a lot of good external stuff to share. You, you know how to follow people, you know how to find mentors, you know what books and tapes and different things you want to have. You also know how to create a culture of learning in your organization because you're internally watching what works and what doesn't for your organization. Organizations fit in this journey too. You're all leaders here. None of us are victims of the places that we work in. And as we start growing, Stephen Covey talks about the circle of concern and the circle of influence. There's a circle of influence that we, we have impact in. And there's a circle of concern that we can't. Geopolitical politics, you know, tensions and all, often we can't do anything about. The Red Sox losing again, you know, we can't do anything about that. They're just, they had a good year, you know, a few years ago, they won a couple world championships, but they're done. Um, <laughs> I'm a Boston fan, I'm real, no, I'm a Boston fan. Hey, when the, when the ball bobbled on that, you know, I was tall, I told my dad to shut up as a, a middle schooler when the, uh, whatever his name, Bruckner bobbled the ball, and I was like, dad said, oh, there they go, they're gonna lose now. And they couldn't lose, because they were up by so much. I told my dad, shut up, in front of guests. <laughs> That's when I became a true Red Sox believer. They're not gonna do it again. All right. Um, <laughs> so it's important that we know where we are on this journey. And what I wanna do is go into the Quadrant Three leadership. I love Quadrant Three leaders. The things Quadrant Three leaders are working on are, what am I hardwiring? How am I, how am I hardwired? Where am I goal setting? How do I set my own goals? And what is my story? What's the story part of who I am? Because that helps you figure your mission, your style of, of leadership, and your values. So we're gonna look at an uh, exercise that helps you with your hardwiring. How many people have done DISC before? Okay, a few of you. Um, those of you who didn't have a good experience, I've been told by people that do this with me that it's a better experience than whatever was inflicted on you and your organization. Um, 
there's two quadrants with the, there's two axes with this too. There's the extrovert and the introvert and the task and the people. So let's go to the, we'll talk about extrovert and introvert first. It's really active and reserved, but we'll use extrovert and introvert and I'm gonna ask you to then self-identify and I know you guys are gonna make this complicated, I think. So for the sake of this exercise, you can't be super mature and in the middle of anything. We know you're brilliant. If you're in the middle, that's awesome. Ambiverts are really good. Um, but you need to make a choice if you're on one side or the other. So extroverts tend to talk fast. There are people that are, there, there are places to go and people to see and, and they're moving. If there's a stage, they want to be on it. And introverts, more reserved people, tend to be pretty calm. And they don't really need to be on stage if there's a stage to be on. So in that very rough kind of estimation. I'd like all the extroverts to come to the front of the room, because you want to be here anyway. <laughs> and all the introverts to go to the back of the room, like around where the bus is, because that'll be safer. So extroverts, or do you talk fast? You, you get energized by people. Introverts tend to want to be, after a conference like this, introverts are going to want to recuperate by being alone. I'm going to talk to the introverts, because the extroverts aren't going to shut up anymore, because I've really... <laughs> I've unleashed the Kraken. Um, all right, so, so the introverts here, you guys have this secret, secret superpower. Extroverts, check this out. These people on the other side of the room can do something amazing. They think, <laughs> and then they speak. We don't know that's possible. Us extroverts are like, we don't know what we've thought until we've said it. It's, so here's the thing, we, it's called verbal processing. It makes it sound better. Uh, we call it, my wife will look at me and say, all right, are you verbally processing or have you made a decision? Because I'd go all over all the other possibilities and feel really good because I'd made a decision and she wouldn't know what happened. Now, where the tension comes in the room is that, and think of this in a staff meeting, introverts tend, more reserved people tend to think things fully through before they share it. So they work it over and they make it like a pearl. Well, an extrovert looks at your pearl of an idea and it's like, it's like throwing a ball of yarn in front of a kitten. Oh, what if we do this? What if we do that? Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? And the introverts are thinking, of course I've thought of that. I wouldn't have shared it without thinking of that too. <laughs> ah! So you can have some tension in the room when you do this, for sure. Um, but think of this with your board members. Some of them aren't going to want to open their Rolodex in this way because they're going to want to write a letter or write an email. Uh, Asking Styles by Andre Kilstead is brilliant because introverts, I, for the first time I saw that introverts could write letters, write emails, and it scripts out what your visit's going to be and it gives them the honor of saying this is what my expectation is. Because introverts tend to like structure. They tend to like consistency. Extroverts don't. It kind of gets boring. And you'll notice that if, if you have an extrovert, they're working on staff and they're chained to their desk, they start eating a lot. Because we need some sort of stimulation and that sugar rush becomes a substitute for being out around people. Um, true story. Okay, so the other thing, now this is gonna be a little, the most complicated part of the exercise is about to happen. Um, I'm gonna ask you to stay in your introvert, extrovert parts, but I'm gonna talk about task versus people. So, Richard Rome does a great thing on the task. People, people, people-oriented people tend to talk about people. If there's a job to do, they'll say, hey, how are you doing? How are your kids? Now, we've got this task to do and I'm here, I need it by five and I'd like you to you know, have it done for me. Task-centered people cut to the chase. Hey, need this done by five. Oh yeah, I got your back, you know, I got you. you know, pull a John, I got you. Um, so it, the other way, I like the Richard Rome way of describing. He said, if you're uh, mowing your lawn and you're, mow you're just mowing it and your neighbor comes over, do you stop to talk to your neighbor or do you keep mowing your lawn because that's the task that you're out to do and you're going to keep <laughs> mowing your lawn, not going to be dissuaded by that neighbor? Now I know it depends on the neighbor. Not all of us have great neighbors. I get that. But if you think you'd keep mowing the lawn, stay in your introvert, extrovert quadrants and go to that side. And if you think you'd stop and talk to your neighbor, go to that side. No in-betweens. This is wonderful. I love this quadrant. How big this quadrant is, that's really cool. We're gonna have to let those, this quadrant just chat because they're not gonna stop, so. All right. So this is how the room is now divided. It's D, I, S, and C. 
We've got the D's in this corner, the high I's in this corner, the S's in this corner, and the C's over here. One thing to notice is if you're with teams, somebody from your team, look at who's on the opposite quadrant, because that's usually where the biggest conflict is. Uh, just a heads up. Um, why I like DISC, it's from the ancient Greeks. They used to think we had four different fluids in us that were a little bit, we had uh, over unbalance or just, you know, there was more of one fluid or another. Uh, and they call it sanguine melancholy, chloric, and uh, phlegmatic. When my parents found out they were melancholies, they got depressed. <laughs> so I like DISC because there's no value judgment with a letter. So let's start talking with the Ds first. You guys are, yeah, you're like, yeah, of course you'll start with us. We're awesome. Um, Ds are, in the Richard Rome way of doing things, Ds are exclamation points. Their style is, we're going to get this thing done, and we're going to do it my way. So, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> do you hear them? It's very fun. So Ds are extroverted, task-oriented. They want to, they're dominant and decisive. Um, they are making decisions. I worked with one organization that's in this room that we did this whole disc thing, and then they said, any observations with it? And the person didn't look at me. Usually the feedback comes to me, but she, she just looked at her team and said, there's nobody in that quadrant. We have no Ds in our organization, and my boss is in a D, and the president of the foundation is in a D. Do you think that's why we don't make any decisions? <laughs> it was brilliant. So Ds are awesome. We would never get stuff done if there weren't Ds in the world. Um, the, oh, it'll get better. You'll get yours. Don't worry. <laughs> There's the light side and the dark side to all of this. Um, the favorite question of a D is what? What is the bottom line? What am I in for? My daughter now knows when she comes to me, I'm a high D. Shocking, I know. Um, she comes to me at my desk, and she'll normally, she used to say, after I did disc with her, before I did disc with her, she would say, so what's your schedule like? How are you? And I was at my desk. I was, what do you want? I know you want me to drive you somewhere, just get to the point. And so now she does that. She's like, what, how is your schedule? Oh. I was supposed to get to the point. Hey, could you take me to the store this afternoon? <laughs> because that's what the Ds want. I had a D boss who wanted 15 minutes with me every other week. And I would talk about the colors and the, at the gala and the relationships with people and the, the hair and who was with whom. And he would glaze over. He just wanted to know, what do you need from me? And what are you doing? And you know, that's all he wanted to know is tasks. Now, the, so that, that what is their question. And think about that when you're sharing with people. Maybe the people that are your board members you're trying to get to be on the journey, you want them to have, they need the what questions. What are we doing? How are we, what's the bottom line to this? What you guys need to hear is that for the rest of this room, you can be a little destructive. Um, you can be kind of like a bulldozer that gets through, plows through stuff. And it's good, because we need stuff plowed through. But you, 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 learning some emotional IQ could help. Um, <laughs> stop whining, they said. <laughs> I was with my sister once, and, I, and I, I had something that I needed to tell her, I felt. And I told her. And she cr just kind of crumpled. She really, it hit her hard. And she said, we were in the ice cream aisle. It was interesting. She said, don't you care how I feel? And I actually thought. No. It, you needed to hear the truth. And that was the truth that was just delivered. So I know the D's like leaving. That's weird. So when you're talking to D's, they're the leaders. You could be talking to people and bringing new donors and saying, hey, we're talking to some leaders in the community. They'd be honored. They'd be like, yeah, that's why you're talking to me. So D's, we love D's. And D's, thank you for helping us get stuff done. All right. Yeah, give them a round of applause. The eyes. <laughs> If you, these eyes, it, it's, like, it's like we planned this, isn't it? Eyes, uh, Richard Rome has eyes, personality insights says eyes is a gold star because if there's a recognition point, how do I do that? They're the donor list people. They're the, I'm the donor, I'm a high eye also, so I'm the one, the occupational hazard of going to the donor wall and looking to see who do I know on the list. All right. It's not my state, it's not my organization. I've met, never made a donation, but maybe I know somebody here. For a high eye, strangers are just friends they haven't met yet. Um, think about our donor stewardship. Do you know why we throw galas a lot? Because it's run by these people. What you and we need to know as this people is they don't necessarily want that stuff. They don't want to be on stage. Um, we are, if you're having an event, you want an eye in there because they're inspirational, they're enthusiastic, they're the cheerleaders like they were cheering before. They are fun. When I did an event uh, for, for fundraise, like annual fund events, I killed the entire agenda. 
I had no idea that my, my bosses, I hadn't really figured this out. Both bosses were really reserved, and they had agendas. Who was going to welcome, who was going to say the, you know, the blessing, who was going to then welcome the welcomer, the next welcomer, and then have the, I mean, it was like, oh my goodness, nobody cares. They just want to see each other. Let's cut this agenda. And so I started going to brew pubs. And I was like a Labrador retriever, <laughs> going up to everybody, making sure they're having a good time. And I had all my talking points that I knew I needed to do, and I got them done. We were done that first one at uh, Boston Beer Works, and I turned over, totally excited. It was like 11 o'clock. I was ready for the next party because we're energized by, by people. And I couldn't find my, develop, my, uh, my boss or the headmaster. And then I looked down. They were, I had to scrape them off the floor. They were so exhausted. They just couldn't get out. So, but eyes, you guys, what, our big question is eyes is who? Who's going to be there? Who's involved? So if you're thinking about what's the journey that you're trying to invite board members to bring into, and they're this type of quadrant, maybe it's the who. Well, we've got these leaders here. We've got other people here. It's going to be fun. Oh, I just did it. All right, well, first of all, we look ditzy, just so you know. What this, the rest of this room thinks we look a little ditzy and inefficient. Because details, eh, who needs them? It'll get done. Annual planning with these people, it's like, well, yeah, we have a half a million dollar goal, and we'll get there in 12 months. I don't have to worry about monthly revenue and stuff. No, we'll just get there. It'll work out in the end. Um, so one of the things for you guys to just know is that, well, two editing things in your writing. One of them is have a funectomy. I know. Pull that fun out of the stuff. When you, you know you're talking with a high eye, if you get an email saying, oh, it'll be really fun, and we're going to have fun, and it's really going to be a fun time, <laughs> because that's a value for high eyes, a lot of these other people want to get stuff done. And that's not really seen as getting stuff done. The fun doesn't matter. They want to know what is in it. What are we going to be doing? Uh, the other thing that we need to do as, as, as uh, high eyes is, well, I'll, I'll explain it to you guys. Email can be so cold and emotionless. You can't read emotions into it. So for a high eye, one exclamation point just isn't enough. <laughs> you need two, three, four, six, all the way across. <laughs> for the rest of the room, one is enough. One gets the point across. So just know that. We love high eyes. They bring life to the party. All right. Give them applause. So if you're thinking about your journey that you're bringing your donors onto, you're asking your board members to bring them onto, maybe they're just not get it, seeing the fun if they're a high eye. And you can try to see what are ways that you could do that in a way that doesn't kill the organization or cause mission creep. S's, I love you guys. S's are the most maligned. Introverts in general are the most maligned by our culture, North American culture anyway, but S's in particular. Because S's, this, these are the people, the S's, uh, personality insights have them as a plus or minus uh, symbol. Because if you're sitting next to an S, or if an S is sitting in a room, and the person on this side of them says, you know, it's a little chilly in here, the S will say, yeah, yeah, I can see that, yep. And then a few minutes later, somebody else says, you know, I'm a little warm in here, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. <laughs> the Ds are saying, well, what is it? Is it hot or cold? Make up your mind. S's are incredibly empathic. They're really good at being able to judge where people are at. And what we need to learn from S's, that, well, those of us that aren't S's, is checking in with them after. Hey, one-on-one -on -one tends to be the right way to do it. Hey, did I, did I run over anybody in that meeting inappropriately? Like, I meant to run over these two people, but did, <laughs> did I leave other collateral damage? Yeah, the D's are like, yeah, you did. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, and so the S's get this. Now, S's, they're, they're steady, they're stable, they tend to be calm speakers. Um, what's interesting with our behavior patterns is when a D hears competition, they're like, yeah, that's like mm, catnip and frio, that's great. It's like throwing raw meat in front of a dog. Yeah, I'm going to be competitive. And S hears that, and they think conflict. <gasps> I don't want to fight with anybody. I don't need to do that. So the language that we use can be really interesting with that. Now, the S's uh, favorite question is how. They like stability. They like to have a, a planned process. How are we going to get things done? S's love people, but they love the small group of people that they know. So if you're going to honor an S, like a board member, if you're going to invite them in to talk about getting new donors, it could be to have a quiet tea. And it's something intimate. It helps the executive director or the staff not have one-on-one -on -one meetings necessarily. But see, S's don't want you to put themselves out, yourself out. My daughter, my, one of my daughters is an S. And there was a car, this is, uh, she got in the back of the seat of the car, and I, in our car it was booster seats. I didn't see that the booster seats were in the back. It was a little Prius. She got in and kind of, I saw her kind of wedge herself in the middle, and I thought, that's weird, but whatever. I'm an extrovert. I could talk to her in the mirror better, you know, when I was driving. It was great. 
I know, right? <laughs> we all have our blinders. So I was, um, when I got out of the, at, the home, at home, I opened the door and couldn't believe it. There were these booster seats in there. As a D or even an I, it would be like, we don't need these now. That's not my, you know, I'm on, I need to sit down. But an S just didn't want to, she knew that her, her sister and her sister's friend would be in the car at some point in the next year. And she didn't really want to <laughs> just upset the apple cart. There's no need to do that. Um, so S's, you just need to know that you can look it here. I'd like to, you guys ready? Could we do an exercise with the S's? All right. Repeat after me. No. Okay, no, no, no I'm, I'm, okay. I know it's hard, I know it's hard. We'll drag it out, mm, say that, mm, oh, mm, oh, mm, oh, no. Okay, good, great. That is a very good word and it's not emotionally charged for most of us. Uh, when you say, no, I can't do that, you're not letting us down, you're not being disloyal, you're being true to yourself and actually helping us make better plans because you can't do it all even though you want to. So it's okay to have boundaries and that's a really healthy thing. We need S's in our organizations because if we only had I's and D's, we'd be blowing apart. S's hold us together and they're the glue. So thank you S's, good job for being, thank you for being here. Now the C's. C's are awesome too. Um, the, the C's are, ta just to remind, because we've gone all the way around, these are the reserved task centered people. Um, C's, the Richard Rome style is a question mark um, because they're always questioning something. Oh, okay. which <laughs> Sarah, did you, you didn't hear that, but Sarah's, because it was more of a reserved Y, not like a D or an I, but she said, why? <laughs> why is it the question mark? <laughs> Touche, very well done, that was awesome. C's have this amazing ability to, to really, really focus on, the, it's, it's really interwiring. They can see the issues and they can see things. That we call them calculating or questioning, and those are nice words for them. That doesn't seem like a bad thing. Um, if, think about it this way. If you're on an airplane and somebody's filling the tank, would you rather have an I or a C putting gas into the plane? Yeah, the eye is going to be like, oh, hey, how's it going, Joe? Oh, it's good to see you. Oh, yeah, and forget to fill up the tank. A C is going to make sure it gets done. They have the checklist. The C at one of my organizations with a database administrator, I would want a list pulled for mailing. She had a five-page check sheet for me to fill out to get the stinking list because she knew I would always, she'd be like, do you want to include this person or include this group? Do you really want those people to get this? And do you want these? Do you want these? Do you want... All these good questions, but questions to many of us are like soul-crushing kryptonite. <laughs> they, we don't, see, what we don't feel from C's is their passion. They have deep passion for our causes, but you guys can look a little bit uh, cold and emotionless, kind of like Spock. Um, you know, just your emotions aren't coming to the, in fact, one speaking coach just this summer, there was a C that was gonna give a talk to Google, and so she was sharing her talk, and it was a really cool story. She had the story part really well, down well, and the coach, a guy named Michael Port said, all right, you'll never do this, but just in, for, in this, this is a safe space, talk at two or three times speed. It's still auto, you know, like still intelligent, make it so that we can still understand you, but just double or triple your speed. She did. And it was awesome. It sounded like she had life in her talk again. It was really, really cool. So it's okay to, you know, to communicate with them a little bit more. Um, it, it, we don't, we're not, you need to telegraph your emotions a little bit if you can, because we're not picking it up. Uh, we just hear, like the CFO at my, uh, my nonprofit once, we got like a 40 day stipend for food. And I never, got, I never used that. I would buy a bagel and coffee and then donors would pay for most of the meals. But I knew in LA it mattered if my shoes were shined or not. So I got a shoe shine and stuck it under miscellaneous. Submitted it to my boss, she signed off on it. Submitted it to the payroll person or whatever. I got a call from the CFO. <laughs> Pittman, what is this? Shoe shine. I had, I'd said shoe shine, I wasn't hiding anything. So I don't do my dry cleaning and charge it to the school, why are you doing that? So, well, because I have this uh, food budget that I'm not using and, and it's representing the school and I wanted to know the local dialect and I know that's part of it with this particular crowd is the shoes. So, Oh, you can't do that, it's against policy. So, but C's are really good with policy. He had been hired because the school had no policies. Well, they did have policies, but they had a lot of holes. And so he was filling holes and he found another one and he filled it. C's, one of the, 
um, the favorite question is why. And it was exactly, that's what it is. Why are we going to do this? Why does it work this way? Why are we, why are we here? Why is Mark still going at this point? Um, but we, one of the things that is really awesome with you guys, with your superpower, one tip that's helped a lot of, a lot of C's in the country is if you're in a brainstorm with your team, let all of them just go. Because they don't make a lot of sense. That's the brainstorm process. It's just getting it out. And then when they've decided that they want to build a ship, that's when your superpower here you know, of asking questions is great. Because they're going to make sure the ship gets built. So if they said, let's build a ship, high eyes are like, yeah, OK, let's see. Uh, we need something durable. Let's build it out of concrete. <laughs> that's durable. And the C's will say, well, shouldn't we have a buoyant material for a ship? <laughs> I was doing this with some army engineers. And do you know what? Concrete's buoyant. It's all about air displacement. It's not about the material. It's about how much air. <laughs> the C's told me that, too. <laughs> so, so think about this. So you get the D's, the I, and C's. Let's give the C's a round of applause. Yay. So, so think about this. So as you're working with your teams, you're, oh, the other thing to notice is the false readings. If you're, behave, if you're noticing uh, I under stress, they act like a really uh, immature C. They start looking at their, no, they start looking at their contracts that they never looked at before. Is that in there? They look at the bullet points. They go, I don't think these things are in here. You know what I'm talking about, C's. Some of you are doing that with your job description. Did they really put that in there? I don't think I'm supposed to do this. C's, under stress, tend to look like immature eyes. They're like, fine, let's have fun. <laughs> like it's a challenge, but it's an, you know, it's an immature one. S's, under stress, tend to look like really immature D's. We're just going to do it my way. And D's, uh, under stress, tend to look like immature S's. Fine, whatever you want. Walk all over me. I don't care. <laughs> so if you're reading some of these with your board, they may be stressed. And it may not be the right, the right thing. You need to get to know them better. But think about this in terms of your journey. If you know where you're at on this, you can learn to speak the local dialect of your board members as they're talking to their friends and their Rolodexes. And then as you can shift, because none of this is about, oh, I can't do that because I'm this quadrant. All of it's about learning to flex. And it'll take more energy for C's to be like I's or S's to be like D's or the other way around. But sometimes we need to expend that energy because our cause is worth it. And the mission that we're doing in the world is worth expending that energy for. As we learn to know what kind of quadrants we are in and take part of that quadrant three leadership um, and analyze and take pieces for it, it'll help us put together the storytelling strategic plan that we're talking about. And those will look different for every organization. Some people will be a spoken word uh, example. Some people will be a, a video. Some people will be a mood board. It doesn't have to be that binder that uh, Bill Littlejohn showed us with all those tabs. But that's when we're going to be able to tell our donors Hey, this is the journey you're on. Yeah, remember Susie? Yeah, Susie got fed. Remember the arts? Yeah, we're putting arts in the community. You still have the episodic TV show like things, but then you have the season arc of this is the journey we're inviting you on, and that's when they're going to tell their friends, "Holy cow, you got to get you I got you got to come here. You got to do this because we're making an amazing impact in this world." And that's one of the ways that you're going to be able to get new donors to your nonprofit. Mm -hmm.